So review of inverse functions. There's a couple ways to think about, think about inverse functions. So you've got some function y equals f of x. Then uh, the inverse function of that, easy way to get it, is x equals f of y. All right, so for example, if I start off with the function y equals x squared, then its inverse function would be x equals y squared. Now, the problem with this is I actually lied just now because this is not a function. And let's take a quick look at its graph to see why. All right, so let's say we'll call f of x, our original function, x squared. And actually, I lied. I want to write that as y equals. Pretty standard parabola. We've done that for ages now. Now, I just said to make the inverse, you just switch x equals y squared. And what you do get is an inverse, but it's a relation, not a function. It's not a function because it fails the vertical line test. Any vertical line you draw in its domain, domain being x equals zero and higher, you're going to get two y values back. So that sucker right there is not a function. So for a function like my red thing to have an inverse function, the original function has to be what we call one to one. That is, it has to pass the vertical line test to be a function, has to pass the horizontal line test also, meaning any horizontal line hits no more than once. So that its inverse is also a function. So if I just erased like the left side of the red parabola, or if I erased the right side, I would have a one to one function. And there is a way to tell Desmos how to only draw part of it, but I can't remember off the top of my head, so we're going to skip that. So I'm just going to draw it. It's easier. So if I modify this original function here to be only for x values that are greater than or equal to 0, then I only get half of the parabola. So we have zero, zero here, and then we have something like over here, one, one, and then we're going to have two, four, which is going to be somewhere in this vicinity. So we just get half of a parabola there. Whoa, that's my best parabola today. For the inverse function, then, since we switch x with y, and that's all I'm doing here for the inverse, the idea is just switch x with y. That's the basic idea of an inverse. then I'm going to get uh, x equals y squared, but only uh, and x is being switched with y, right? Instead of, so instead of x being greater than or equal to 0, this one becomes y is greater than or equal to 0, which means I'm only going to get the top half. So I'm going to get 0, 0, 1, 1, and then 4, 2, so somewhere over here-ish. So this would be that inverse function. So thinking about that in a couple of different ways. My original function, let's call it f of x. So I have x versus f of x. f of x here is x squared. Has the point 0, 0, 1, 1, and 2, 4. The inverse function switching x with y and changing perspective. So I'm going to write y over here, and then I'm going to call it g of y over there, gets everything the other way around. Now, some of these points, 0, 0, it doesn't matter if I switch them, 1, 1, doesn't matter if I switch them, but this one becomes 4, 2. So everything that was once x becomes y, everything that once was y becomes x, including the domain and range. So whatever the domain and range of the original function, they switch to be the range and domain of the other function, switching x and y. Other big thing about inverse functions, usually we write f inverse for the new function. If you compose a function with its inverse function, they cancel each other out and you get x back. So this is another super, super important idea about functions and its inverse. Now, again, everything gets flipped about that function. 
So for example, uh, at this point two four, if I focus on that for a moment, let's highlight that sucker, we could find the tangent line there. And we know that the derivative of uh, x squared, so y prime, oops, wrong color, y prime for the original function, that is f prime of x is equal to 2x. And when x is equal to 2, 2 times 2 is 4, I get a tangent line here with a slope of 4. The inverse function, things got flipped, x and y. The slope here is 4 over 1. So on the inverse function, since x and y change place, the slope on the inverse function must be 1 over 4. All right, let's go over here and calculate that. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to solve this for x. So I get, uh, oh, solve this for y, excuse me. So y would be equal to plus or minus the square root of x. Now, again, I had decided that x had to be greater than or equal to 0. So that forces y to be greater than or equal to 0 here. So I can throw out the negative, meaning I only want the positive square root of x or the non-negative square root of x, excuse me. And we know that, so this is my function g of x now, that g prime of x from past exploration is 1 over twice the square root of x. I'm looking here at x equals 4. And so if I plug in 4, g prime of 4 will be 1 over twice the square root of 4. Square root of 4 is 2. 2 times 2 is 4. So there's that 1 fourth by actually taking the derivative. The first time I came up with that slope here, remember, all I did was think inverses simply switch x with y. That's two big things you need to know about inverses. One, switch x with y. Most important fact. Next super important fact. If you compose a function with its inverse and they're both functions, then they pretty much cancel each other out and you get x back. So other classical inverse functions besides the square and the square root that you may be familiar with. So function versus inverse. We have x squared versus the square root of x, provided we restrict that domain. x is greater than or equal to 0. But we don't want to always have to restrict the domain. For example, if we looked at x cubed, its inverse is the cube root of x. And you do not have to do any restriction because it does not bend back on itself. Other famous ones you may be familiar with are uh, 10 to the power x and the log of x are inverses. Or the natural log of x, its inverse is e to the power x. The sine of x has an inverse called the arc sine of x. And sometimes we refer to that as the sine inverse not to be confused with the one over sine, which is the cosecant, right? That's not one over sine, that is the arc sine. So this is not the cosecant, this is the sine inverse. Very different function. All right, let's see, anything else I wanted to say about inverse basics? That's about it. So into the calculus of inverse basics, we're going to take this, I, there's two ideas. One, uh, if a function has a slope that's, let's say, a over b, then the inverse function would have to have a slope of b over a, because we have to switch x and y. This was change in y over change in x. So I just switched the change in y over change in x. Okay, so that's Rule number one, we just looked at. The other comes from the fact that a function and its inverse, when composed, cancel. And you may notice here, this is a function composition. And if I involve the derivative here, that's going to involve the chain rule. So we're going to apply the chain rule to this. What does chain rule say about this? 
So the chain rule says, if you take the derivative of a composition of, of uh, functions, then the first thing you do is take the derivative of the outer function. So I need to know f prime of whatever, and the inner function stays untouched at the moment. And then you multiply that by the derivative, I'm gonna write it this way, of the inner function, which happens to be f inverse of x. Now, it turns out that like you can square both sides of an equation and be good and take the square root of both sides of an equation to be good or multiply both sides of an equation by two, you can take the derivative of each side of the equation and you'll get a new equation that's equal. So if I take the derivative of the left side, the derivative of x is just one. And next thing I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna solve this for the derivative of, of the inverse function, which means I just want to divide this sucker to the other side. So if I do that, I get my derivative of an inverse function is equal to one over the derivative of the original function with the inverse function plugged into it. And this is a very powerful formula. And we need this to figure out derivatives of inverse trig functions useful for inverse trig functions, which is what we're gonna do next. So that we don't have to go back to that limit of the difference quotient where h goes to zero, which is a little bit harder to use. So let's try one. Let's keep going. So if I have f of x is equal to the sine of x, then the inverse function, I'm gonna call that g of x for now, is equal to the arc sine. And if you took trig from me, you know I do not like the sine to the little negative one version of this. I prefer arc sine. I'll show you why in just a minute if you've forgotten or if you didn't take trig from me. So these two functions are inverse functions of each other, and I want to know what is the derivative of the arc sine. In other words, if I start with the function sine of x, I want to know what is the derivative of the inverse function. And I have a formula that says, well, find the derivative of the original function and then plug the inverse function into it. All right, so I'm calling my inverse function g of x here. So another way to write this is one over f prime with g of x plugged in, All right? We can totally do that. So if we apply that to our situation here, the derivative with respect to x of the arc sine, it's gonna be one over the derivative of the sine, which is the cosine, and then we plug into it my inverse function, which is the arc sine. And you, re, you may recollect seeing things like this in, in trig. What is the cosine of the arc sine of x? And it turns out we can algebraically simplify that. And I just wanna remind you how we do that. And that is related to the relationship of a function and its inverse function. So if we think about right triangle trigonometry here, In, in this case, I have some angle and I'm calling that angle X. Why am I calling that angle X? Because there's an X right there. And the sine here is equal to the opposite side over the adjacent side. And we're gonna call the hypotenuse one in this case. So on this triangle right here, the sine of X is equal to opposite over adjacent. And other things I could name here is that the cosine of x is equal to, oh, I did that wrong, that's the tangent I wrote down. Gary, what are you thinking? The sine of x, green, there we go, is equal to opposite over one. just the opposite side, 
and the cosine is just the adjacent side there. Again, if the hypotenuse is one. <clears throat> Here, I have the arc sine of x. What does that mean? Well, arc sine gives us an angle. So in other words, the arc sine of x is equal to some angle theta. Rewriting that, the sine of theta is equal to x. So I'm gonna redraw my picture with that in mind. So again, what I'm looking at is, let's get my highlighter. What does the arc sine of x mean? Well, arc sine, arc is an angle. So the arc sine of x is some angle. I don't know what that angle is, but I can always rewrite that statement inverse as the sine of the angle equals x. And so now if I put that information in the triangle here, this time I'm calling the angle theta. We know that sine is <clears throat> opposite over hypotenuse, so that makes the opposite side x here. If this is x and that is one, what would the adjacent side be? So I know the sine of x is one, I need the adjacent side to figure out the cosine. Well, that's where we use the Pythagorean theorem. Pythagorean theorem, let's name this question mark for now, says that question mark squared plus x squared equals one. Solving for question mark, question mark squared equals one minus x squared. So question mark has to be plus or minus the square root of one minus x squared. And we're just gonna go with the plus for simplicity. So the cosine here has to be the square root of one minus x squared. Okay, why do I care what the cosine is? Because I have a cosine right here. So if I take the arc sine here, which I'm also calling theta, that means this whole expression here can be rewritten as what is one over the cosine of theta. And according to my picture here, oops, that should be a theta and a theta, the cosine of theta is square root of one minus x squared. So this is one over square root of one minus x squared. And I now have the derivative of the arc sine. And we're gonna test that out to see if it, works, if it works for a specific number. Can we find a tangent line? All right, so this is a marathon problem we're looking at. So I'm starting off, my original function is f of x equals the arc sine of x. And it helps if I put an equal sign in there. All right, so there's a picture of the arc sine. And again, it doesn't wave infinitely like the sine does because then it wouldn't be a function. Since the sine waves along the x-axis, the arc version without a domain restriction would wave along the y-axis and not be a function. So remember, we had to restrict the domain from negative pi over two to pi over two. I think the inverse function, I'm gonna call that g of x, is equal to one over the square root of one minus x squared. So that would be what the inverse function looks like. I'm gonna turn that off just for a second. And I'm just gonna pick a test point on here. So for example, if we pick the point, how about, uh, we could just go like one f of one, which is right on the end point. Now let's pick something inside. Let's go with like one half, f of one half. All right, that point right there. To find the slope there, that should just be plugged into my function g here. So the slope at that point, let's call that m, that ought to be just g of 0 0.5. Yeah, so the, according to that equation, the slope ought to be about 1.157, 1547. To test if that's true, like do I have the right inverse function here, we'll just make the tangent line, which we use the point slope form. So y minus y1, which is just f of 0 0.5, equals m, which I called m here, times x minus x1, which is 0 0.5. And if we zoom in there, that's gonna look like a pretty good tangent line. Zoom in. 
And I'm only concerned about that point right there. Zoom in. And yeah, that looks like a pretty good tangent line right there. So after all that algebraic and geometric jiggery pokery, we do have an inverse function, the derivative, the derivative of the arc sine is one over the square root of one minus x squared. So we're just gonna apply this inverse technique to some other trig functions, see what we get. 